Anybody got an encouraging word? Anybody feel lifted up, supported, encouraged? That's good, because that really is one of the primary functions of the church, is to encourage one another, to build up one another. So please do not wait until we do this from the front on a Sunday morning. Say, hey, do this. Like, make this a regular part. When you, when you run into somebody in, in the church or anywhere, just say, God, give me an encouraging word for them. Give me something that I can share with them that will make their day, that will show them that you are talking to them, that you're on their mind. Uh, that can be just the step that they need. So it's easy to do it in this situation because there's a few of us. Speaking of that, thank you for being here today. I don't know how many of you even know this, but last night it reached minus 40 here in Edmonton. That's cold. And the fact that you came to church when it's minus 40, wow, good on you. Keep it up. Keep up the good work because I'm sure there's a reward for that somewhere. There's got to be perseverance. I don't know. There's got to be something there. Anyways, we want to get started today. And the... The topic for today is generosity. Actually, the title I've given it is Freedom Through Generosity. And I want to kind of tear apart and take a look, break it down to see what does it mean to be generous and how does it affect us? What do we get out of it? Is it, is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Is it a beneficial thing? In, in the book of John, John chapter 10, 10, it, it, this is probably one of the most profound and important scriptures in the Bible. It says, The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. Just think of that. That, that kind of factors in the motivation of both good and evil. Everything the enemy does is to steal, kill, and destroy. So when something happens in your life, of, if, if some destruction comes or some theft comes or some, some death comes, understand that that does not come from God, but rather that comes from the enemy. Everything that comes from Jesus, he produces life. So bad things come from the enemy, good things come from God. And we got to really get this understanding that when bad things happen in your life, it's not God the one who is causing it. When bad things happen in your life, it's a direct result of the enemy attacking us, the enemy bringing destruction, the, the enemy trying to kill and destroy. Uh, for us, we need that, that better understanding that the evil comes from the evil because that's how we know how to deal with it. Like, if you just kind of sit in a corner and say, oh yeah, I'm getting beat up, blah, 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 I'm just blaming God for this, you're not going to get out of the corner. But when you recognize that the attacks are coming from the enemy, now you can fight back. Now you can do what you're called to do to actually lead uh, in the way that God intended. So Jesus came to give it life and to give it abundantly. Now let me ask you a question. Do you feel that you are walking in an abundant life? Take a moment and think about that. Do you think that you are living that abundant life that Jesus promised? Is there something lacking? Is there something missing in this abundant life? Is there some part of it that you say, you know what, I'd be abundant except for this. Or I, I'd be walking in abundance except for this. Because let's all be honest. Living in Canada makes you in the top 95% of the world. Okay, so just by living here, you're already better off than most people in the world. So we're not necessarily talking about abundance as simply just being uh, wealth or, or, or finances. I'm talking about every area of your life. I'm talking about health. I'm talking about uh, perspective, energy, your, your vision, your, your goal, things you're working towards. Are you feeling that you, you have what you need to reach where you want to go? That's really what I see and define as the abundant life, is the abundant life means you have everything you need to do what you're supposed to do. That, that to me, is the de definition of it, right? It, abundant life doesn't mean you have five cars, three homes, and you take a six-month vacation every year, okay? That may be how we look at it in human terms, 
But in God's kingdom, abundance means something totally different. It means what you, you have what you need and more. So if you have an abundance, you have what you need, plus you have more than that. And when we have more than that, what are we supposed to do with that more? Share. Share, exactly. We're supposed to give out of our abundance. But a lot of us get caught up in this and saying, well, I don't have enough, so how can I give? Well, that may make sense in human terms, but in kingdom terms, it's kind of reversed. Because the principle of giving, God actually expects us to give of our first fruits. The first of what you get belongs to God. Anything after that belongs to you. Actually, everything you own belongs to God, so it's kind of semantics. But the first fruit is what God calls for. So he doesn't want the leftovers. He doesn't want the crumbs that's left over in the container. He actually wants the beginning, the first. And, and that, that principle is throughout Scripture, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, where God wants your best. He wants what's up front. So in your own life, what are the areas that you have that maybe you don't feel like you're walking in abundance yet? What are the areas that you see? Um, obviously, I, I think probably the number one thing when they do surveys, even in, in Canada and in Alberta, the number one thing that people say they don't have enough of is, any guesses? Money, finances, right? That, that's the number one thing. It, it's quite interesting to see how much the Bible actually has to say about money and how to manage money. But when we think about generosity, I think most of us would agree that it's a good thing. How many here think that they would like to be considered a generous person? Put up your hand, come on. If you want to be considered a generous person, put up your hand. Because when you look at the opposite of generosity, what's the opposite? Greed, right? Greed really is the opposite of generosity. Generosity says I'm giving, greed says I'm taking. How many people want to be known as a greedy person? We don't. Even in the world we get this. Like Even outside of the church in the world, if a person is greedy, that's a negative thing. If a person is generous, that's a positive thing, right? They, they, they give people awards, they Give them TV shows. They do everything with people if they're generous. But if they're greedy, it's like, come on, you, you stay over there. Like, There's a huge rise in, in our, our social climate right now against people who are considered to be greedy, right? Keeping everything for themselves. And there, there's a good reason for that. Because generosity is actually the much more beneficial characteristic than greed is. Now, one thing to notice is that Generosity is birthed in gratitude. You cannot be generous without first being grateful. If you want to be a generous person, you first have to be a grateful person. you got to learn to be grateful for what you have. Because if you're not grateful for what you have, it's very easy to become a greedy person. Okay? Somebody who wants more, who wants more, who wants more, and guess what? They want more. But a generous person is content with what they have and they give out of their abundance. And it all begins with being thankful for what you do have. Now, although a lot of people will agree that generosity is a great thing to do and a great attribute, I think if you were to go out and pull people on the streets and, and get it a perspective, I think a large majority of people would say, yeah, it's good to be generous. But how many people actually act out their generosity? It's a good question. Uh, Proverbs eleven twenty four to 25 tells this. There is one who scatters and yet increases all the more. And there is one who withholds what is justly due and yet it results in only want. The generous man will be prosperous and he who waters himself will be watered. Now the analogy here. Uh, in Proverbs 11, is talking about a farmer. It's talking about a farmer with some seed. 
The farmer goes out to his field, and he scatters the seed across the field. Now think about this for a moment. For us, we, uh, we understand, yeah, in order to grow a crop, first you've got to plant the seed, right? But think about this from the farmer's perspective. He's taking what he has, okay, and throwing it away. He can keep it for himself, and he can live off that grain, and he can eat it and do that, but it will have a limited supply. Eventually, he's going to run out of grain if he just keeps it in the bin. But if he takes that grain and casts it into the field and waters it and maintains it, what happens? There becomes an abundance. That one seed now turns into 30, 40, 60, 80, 100 seeds, whatever it is. It's exponential growth. But in order for that exponential growth to take place, the farmer first has to take that seed and throw it into the dirt and believe that it's going to produce greater results. The same thing applies for us today, and this is what, what this, this, this story is talking about, is that it demonstrates that we need to have, be willing to give up what we already have in order to gain the ever-increasing more. If you hold on to what you got, it's going to deplete. It's going to be less. It's like the book of Malachi says, uh, you have this problem where whatever you put into your pockets disappears because you got holes in your pockets, right? You feel like you're in that mindset where you never have enough. Well, the human nature is, is when you don't have enough, you got to hang on to it. You got to hold it tight because that's all you got left. But the kingdom is designed a little bit different. The kingdom says, hey, you got to give this away. you got to use this. you got to get rid of it so that it can produce more. It goes back to the, the great illustration where Jesus is talking in the parable uh, of the, the men. And he gave them the talents and he gave different amounts to each one. They all went out and they used their, their talents to increase the wealth of the master. And the one who had the least came back and said, well, I knew you were you're hardy. I knew, knew that you were a mean man, so I just took it and I buried it. Here's exactly what you gave me. And, and what was Jesus' rebuke? He said, he said, the master said that even if you took that money and threw it into a bank account, you would have at least gained interest on it. It's interesting to note that the least thing that could have happened was that he just put it in the bank and collected interest on it. How many of us today, that's our investment strategy, <laughs> right? We just take it, throw it in the bank, and hopefully we get some interest on it. That's actually the least thing that Jesus said. That's the least thing you could do to actually increase it. Because Jesus has different ways of seeing this grow and seeing it increase. Now, I want to ask you a question. I want you to think hard. I want you to think deep. Take a deep breath. Are you a generous person? Do you think of yourself as being a generous person? Now let's switch it up a bit. Do the people around you, if you have a spouse, your spouse, if you, you have parents or parents or whatever, would they think you're a generous person? Are you the type of person who eats the last cookie in the cookie jar? Or do you leave it for somebody else? If you and a vehicle are approaching the exact same parking spot in a mall, you both get there at the exact same time, do you let them have it? How cold is it? It's really cold. <laughs> it's minus 40. <laughs> or do you take it yourself? When you see somebody merging on the white mud, do you slow down and let them in, or do you speed up so they don't get ahead of you? Whoa, these are touching a nerve. On Boxing Day, do you push everybody out of the way so you get the deal? Or do you just not go shopping on Boxing Day? <laughs> right? You see, we, when we talk about generosity, we often talk about money. Okay, we often talk about finances. Am I generous? But generosity goes much larger than simply your finances. 
Generosity is actually a core element of who you are. It's an expectation of God of who we will become. God wants you to be a generous person. Why? Well, don't you think he's generous? Don't you think that's a quality of God that he wants each one of us to exude and to emphasize and to relate to? So if we look at our national averages and just see, like, on average, most Canadians, when surveyed, believe that we are generous people, okay? Most Canadians believe they are generous. But let's see if the stats back it up. In Canada, 20.4% of tax filers give to a charity. 20.4% of people who file their taxes actually report that they give to a charity. This is the clincher, though. The average of 0.53% of their total income. The average Canadian who gives, gives 0.53%. 5-3% of their income. Just put that in perspective. If you have $100, what is 0.53%? 53 cents. Okay? Just think of that. That's the, what the average Canadian gives. Now, we've got to give kudos to Manitoba. Manitoba are actually the most generous province and they give 23.8% of the population gives. And they give an average of 0.76% of their annual income. Now, this might surprise you, but people in Quebec give the least at 0.26%. That means for every $100, they give about 25 cents. Looking at these... Would you say that Canadians are generous? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> that is a catch. That is the catch, okay? Uh, because in compared to Canadian and American, Americans give quite a lot higher uh, ratio uh, to charities, but they also have a lot more benefits in giving. So they actually report everything that they give, whether they give it to the, the, the person who stops at the front door to give them cookies, but again, it's a percentage of that. But this is, just for everyone's benefit, this is just what people report on their income tax receipts. Okay, So this is for people who give. We don't know when they just give five bucks out of their wallet. We don't know if they give something and don't get a charitable receipt. This is based solely on charitable receipts that have been given. Luke 6.38 says, Give and it will be given to you. They will pour onto your lap good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. For by the standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. Okay, get the picture here. Get gets what's happening, okay? There would be a pile of grain. They would walk up with a scoop, and the scoop that they would use to give away would be the same scoop that God would use to give back to them. Okay, so the level in which they give is the level in which they receive. That's the principle that's happening here. So if you give a little, you will get a little. If you give a lot, you will get a lot. Now this is a caveat. This is something we have to really understand and know. Proper giving, you do not give to get. Okay, you got to understand this. This is this is something that the prosperity movement has really clung on to. And it really sickens my soul uh, that they, they latch onto this that says, hey, you give to get. If you send me money, God will bless you. Okay? If your motivation of giving is to get more, it doesn't work. Let me just say that right out. Your motivation for giving needs to be obedience and worship. Okay? That's why you give. Not to get, but out of an act of worship. And uh, You see, generosity involves our character, who we are at the core. It includes much more than money. It includes your time, your energy, your skills, your talents, your abilities, your knowledge. Everything that you are has a potential to be given away. 
If you know something that other people don't know, you can share your knowledge. Okay? You can be a generous person by sharing your knowledge. If you know a lot about something and you share that with someone, you can be generous in sharing your knowledge. If you know a lot and you keep it to yourself, are you generous with your knowledge? No, you're not. It's part of your very nature, part of your being is to be generous. You're, you're generous. And, and I'll tell you this, I'll, I'll say, we, we often focus on money, but I will tell you probably the most difficult thing to give away today in our culture is your time, right? That is the most difficult thing. It's, it's the most difficult thing. Like, as a church, we have less of an issue financially. We have more of an issue people giving us their time to carry out ministry, okay? And this has been an ongoing thing forever and ever. The most valuable commodity right now is our time. Now, just to switch gears a little bit, giving a panhandler five bucks does not mean you're generous. In fact, you could actually be doing more harm than good. Why? Because if they take that money you give and use that to feed their addiction, are you actually helping them? You're not. So just a little piece of advice. Uh, if you want to help the homeless, give it to the organizations that actually help the homeless. Okay, give it to them and say, okay, yeah, I want to help. Because then they can actually use it to help it. You don't want to be the one supporting their addiction. Luke 21, 1 to 4 says, And he looked up and saw a rich putting in their gifts into the treasury. And he saw a poor widow putting in two small copper coins. And he said, Truly as I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them. For they all gave out of their surplus, putting it into the offering. But she gave out of her poverty poverty and put it in all she had to live on. You see, Jesus is clearly saying here that the amount you give here is not important, but rather the comparative portion. Now, we all understand this. This is, this is something that isn't foreign to us. If a multimillionaire gives a hundred bucks to a homeless shelter, what do we think? Oh, whoopee ding dong. Right? No big deal. But if a nine-year-old kid goes out for weeks collecting bottles and gives that same hundred dollars to that homeless shelter, it'll be a new story. They're splashing out everywhere. Why? We understand the comparative nature of giving. If you have a lot and give a little, that's not impressive. But if you have a little and give a lot, that's very impressive. And that's what Jesus was pointing out here. Now, admittedly, uh, generosity is actually a lot more than just giving money. Generosity is a characteristic of who you are to be. It's part of your Christian nature. It's part of who you are. Um, when you look at the, the fruit of the Spirit, there's one version that actually, the NRSV, I think it is, instead of the word goodness, it actually puts in the word generosity. Okay? They're the only one who does it, but when you actually drill down in, into uh, generos or goodness, one of the descriptions of goodness is benevolence, and one of the descriptions of benevolence is the ability to give to charity. So it actually is a characteristic that God wants to develop in each one of us. It's something that he wants to build up. It's something that he wants us to be, is to be generous people. But for some of us, being generous can be a bigger challenge than it is for others. Some people, from birth, have this ability to give. Some do not. I don't know where you fall. I don't know where, where you place. But I, I want to show you the, these two little videos uh, just to give a little bit of credence to what I'm saying. Let's start up the first one. Let's get the sound on there too, yeah. Now let's show the next video. Make the hobo again now. Låt Victor ha burken. Det 
Det finns andra burkar. Det finns andra. Snäll, Viktor. Now, if you ki have kids, you've all been there, right? I, I love this video. Why? Because he actually, the, the one twin tries to give the other twin the, the bottle three times. You notice that? The first time he goes to give it to him, then he pulls it back. No, I don't want to give this. The next time he goes to give it to him, but the twin is crying so much he doesn't even know he's offering it to him. Then he pulls it back again. And then he goes the third time, and now the kid's ready to receive it, right? So he gets it. Being generous is something that each one of us may have different levels or different things that we need to understand to walk in it. Some people naturally are, are generous people. Okay, whether they were raised with it, whether or not they have it. Um, but generosity is not dependent upon your financial status. Okay, we've already shown this from the beginning. It's not that you need to be rich to be generous. Jesus uses the example of the widow who had two minus. She was poor. She was as poor as poor as poor could be. And yet she was very generous. So generosity is not dependent upon what you have, but really your attitude behind it of what you're willing to give. So generous people are willing to give. And God desires you to be generous just like he is. Generous with your time, your giftings, your ability, your resources, and yes, your finances. He actually desires you to be Generous in every area of her life. Not just one or two aspects. Not just, okay, I'm generous with this, but I'm not generous in this. If you're generous with your finances, but not generous with your time, guess what? God's going to work on you in one area, and what's that going to be? Helping you to become generous with your time. Okay? God wants to develop generosity throughout your being, throughout who you are. Being generous is part of who you are. Just as we know how God first loves us, we know that we are generous because God's generosity towards us. God's generosity is called grace and it's undeserved. It's a gift. It's bestowed upon us by a giver who loves us for who we are, not what we do. That's why God's generous. Now today I want to focus a little bit on the financial aspect of being generous. Why? Because I think it's, it's probably one of the most critical areas that we need to work on in our lives. It's, it's probably one of the most foundational areas that it's hard to give over to, right? It, it's like, yeah, I'll do anything as long as it doesn't involve my wallet, right? If you've ever made that statement. But just looking at the, the amount of time that Jesus spoke about money and finances and how to measure it. It's something that we cannot ignore. You know, as a pastor, I have to admit, I don't speak on money very often. I, I don't like to. For whatever reason, I can tell you why. But um, it's something that, you know, I, as a pastor, I've often even forgot to take up an offering. Okay. It's never a priority for me. It's never something that I consciously think of. I just realize that money is a tool that is needed to do what God has called us to do. I actually see it that money, or better, better yet said, the lack of money is actually a deterrent from doing what God wants us to do. But I've come to a realization and a hope, and I'm trying to walk in it, is that God gives us everything we need to do what he's called us to do. I also recognize that there is an enemy who's doing everything he can do to prevent us from walking in the abundance that God has for us. Okay? So as I mentioned at the beginning, the enemy wants to steal, kill, and destroy. God came to give life and to give it abundantly. One of the areas where I see the enemy attacking the church most fluently and most effectively is in the area of finances. 
Okay, I see the enemy as smearing the church. I see the enemy as uh, restricting the finances of individuals, of people. But we'll get into that a little bit more later. But I'm also conscious of the fact that there's a lot of people in the world that think the church just wants their money. Okay? And deservedly so. There's a, a, a very bad influence out there that seems to be making a lot of noise and allowing a lot of people to gather an idea about a church that I believe is fundamentally flawed, but it, we've seen it over and over again. Let me, let me show you this video just to explain what I'm saying. You know, I've owned three different jets in my life and, I, and used them and just burning them up for the Lord Jesus Christ. Televangelist Jesse Duplanta says God himself told him it's time for an upgrade. He said, I want you to believe me for a Falcon 7X. So I said, okay. A Falcon 7 jet like this one to preach to more people around the world. And he's asking his followers for the $54 million. I really believe that if Jesus was physically on the earth today, he wouldn't be riding a donkey. From his Louisiana headquarters, Duplantis is among a group of televangelists who preach that their wealth is God's will. This preys upon the poorest people that want or need money badly, where they're told if they give money, God's going to bless them a hundredfold. Duplantis lives in a 35,000 square foot mansion, tax free. He's asking everybody who has less than he has to pay for this jet, and I, I don't get that, you know? Fellow televangelist Kenneth Copeland recently bought a $36 million Gulfstream 5 jet. Praise God. Isn't that good? The two have commiserated about how they can't fly or pray with commercial airline passengers. This dope-filled world, right. and get in, an air, get in a long tube with a bunch of demons. Right, that's exactly the And it, it's deadly. We asked Jesse Duplantis and his ministries for comment, but they declined to respond. So far... No indication whether he's received any contribution for his jet. Tom Costello, NBC News, Washington. Hey, NBC News fans, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe. So when I watch things like that, down here, it gets me sick to my stomach. Here. Let me tell you that there's people who call themselves part of the church who really are not honoring God at all. There's no honor in that. Everyone in this room who, who attends church and you're watching online, you, you understand that this is the few and far between, okay? Eighty-some percent, the vast majority of churches in North America are under uh, 150 people, okay? It's a very few ministries out there that have this precedence. But who does the media report on? Who does the media tell about the stories of these outlandish ideas and purchases? And They will focus in on this. And then the people in the world who catch this on their, their nightly news or whatever associate that with other churches. And they believe that the church as a whole simply wants their money. Now, I have known this for years. And so I have done everything I can do to distance myself from that type of thinking. I want people to know I'm not here to soak the flock. I'm not here to take money. Guess what? If, if money was a, an idea for me, if that was my goal, if that was my desire, I really would not have become a pastor. Okay? Honestly. If you guys, like, I'm very appreciative of the salary I get here from the church. I, I'm very grateful for it. But if you break it down per hour... I'm getting just over minimum wage, okay? The number of hours I put in, the wage I get paid, if I didn't get a salary, if I got an hourly wage, it would just be over minimum wage, okay? You do not become a pastor in order to make money. You don't do it. And yet, this is the image that a lot of people have of the church. That's the image that a lot of people think, well, the church is just after their money. So I've done everything I can do to distance myself from that. Okay? I don't want people to think. That that's why on a Sunday morning, when we take up an offering, one of the things we do is we tell people, if you're visiting, don't give. 
right? Don't feel obligated to give. We're not, we're not interested in that. We do that solely for the reason so that people understand we're not after your money. We're after something better, and that's you. We want to see you reach your destiny. We want to see you reach what God has called you to do. That's about it. But the church still needs to operate. How many of you know that a building like this, uh, first of all, how many of you like being inside a warm building when it's cold outside? Okay. The church pays about $1,000 a month just for the utilities. Okay. Uh, that's a basic fee that we have to pay. There's no way around it. You like sitting in chairs? They don't just give chairs away. We have to buy them. Everything you look and everything you see around you, somebody paid for it through their giving. Okay? Everything that a church has, every part of every structure, the, the pastor salaries, everything gets paid for because somebody gave. So there's still this aspect to understand that even though we want to distance ourselves from those who are solely in it for the money, we still have to recognize that money is a tool that needs to be carried out and used wisely and appropriately. You see, I, I have many dreams. You guys know I'm a dreamer. And a lot of my dreams are contingent upon certain finances coming in to do that. Now, please realize... Some of my dreams are so massive, I, I fully understand that they're never going to be supported by the church. Okay? God's going to perform another s source of revenue. Um, and I'm looking forward to that day. right? But at the same time, we need to understand that there are data, data operations. Now, uh, I want to explain a little bit more why this has is, is become a, a battle for me. See, I, I don't like talking about money, but then when I read the scriptures, Jesus spent a lot of time talking about money. 16 of the 38 parables that Jesus taught were actually dealt with how to deal with finances, how to deal with money, okay? 16 out of 38. If you actually look at the Gospels and look at what Jesus said, one out of 10, or one out of 10 verses, so 288 in all, deal directly with the subject of money. Jesus talked about money. Why? I think it's because he knew that money was something that was very close to our heart. That it was something that we would worry about, that we would deal with. But Jesus spent a lot of time teaching us how to deal with it. But this is where the first time I really had a, a run-in with the prosperity gospel. How many have ever heard of uh, John Jacob's power team? One or two of you, not too many. This is long ago in a galaxy far, far away. In the early 90s, uh, I was really into bodybuilding, okay? I was into weight training. It was a huge part of, of what my day encompassed. I would work out two, three hours a day, just really desired to be physically fit and do this. Not only was I do, into this, but a lot of my friends were into it. It, it kind of came, the, we grew up in a small town, and there really wasn't a lot of other things to do. So we would spend time working out. We would t spend time exercising. When I heard that John Jacobs and the power team was coming uh, to Edmonton, uh, I made this a priority that I was going to get as many of my friends there because I knew or I understood that the purpose of this, that John Jacobs was an evangelist, the purpose of this event was an evangelistic outreach, and I knew if I could get my friends to it, they would hear the gospel. Now, I've learned a lot about that, that it's not their job to preach the gospel. It was my job to preach the gospel to my friends, but at that time, I saw this event as being an amazing opportunity. I got a number of my friends to come, and we sat there uh, in this church, and these guys were doing amazing feats of strength. Okay? They were snapping bats over their knees. Uh, they were blowing up hot water bottles. They were busting uh, handcuffs. They were drilling nails into boards with just their hand, like things that were impressive. I actually got into this for a while, and I actually got to the place where I could blow up a hot water bottle. 
very dangerous. Don't ever try it because if it malfunctions, you blow out your lungs. But I actually got to the place where I could blow up a hot water bottle and I could pop it. Okay? I was into these things. I, I could break the bat over my knee. Nobody would ever give me handcuffs to see if I could break them, but <laughs> it was fun. It was a fun time. And during this event, there was this awesome and, and great feats of strength, and they brought it down to a time, and the guy says, you know what, I have something that is really important. It's probably the most important decision you will ever have to make in your life. And in my soul, I'm like, okay, he's going to give the gospel message. I'm excited about this. Um, and I was just praying, God, let their ears be open. Let them hear what you want to say. And he goes through this long appeal, and then he turns on this thing. I'm looking for eight people to give me $1,000 each for a piece of the some Bible. And I'm just like, what? What? This was a perfect time for you to share the gospel message. You had everyone's attention. You had everyone keyed in to what you were going to say. And you turned it into an offering call. I promised myself at that moment that I would never allow money to get in the way of gospel. I would never allow money to get in the way of sharing the gospel. And that's really formulated my life from here on. Is, 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 you know what? Money is a tool, but I don't want it to be a focus. I, I just want it to be taken care of. I, I want the real ministry to happen. So now when we look at giving, you, you now get an understanding of, of my hindrance, why I, I really am against the prosperity gospel movement. I, you know what, I believe that God wants to prosper us, but I don't believe that that's the focus. Okay? I don't believe God wants you just to have a bigger bank account. If he gives you a bigger bank account, it's not to have a bigger bank account, it's to use it to further his kingdom. Right? If God has given you something, it's to use it not just as a support structure. Far often people are looking for their windfall so they don't have to rely on God's provision anymore. Think about that. Just think of the difference between what our cultures used to be and what they're like now. You see, when I read the stories of, of evangelists from the past, I read their testimonies, every single one of them have the same thing where they were down to their last dollar. They were down to their last cents. And they were walking or they were doing something. Uh, John G. Lake is one of my favorite. He tells the story of how he's taking his family. He was called to come over to America. Um, and he's getting on the boat. He had a certain amount of money, and he calculated that by having to buy the meals on the boat and doing all these things, the money would get him right to land. But when he got off the boat, there was a departure tax, a port tax that they'd have to pay to actually get into the U.S., and he didn't have the money for that. And so he was just believing God, 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 I, I'm doing this as an act of faith. I'm stepping out. I'm, I've spent every cent I have to get over here. Uh, while he was on the boat, it's really neat because there's a story of people bringing them food, right, uh, of occasion where they didn't have the food and people would just bring them food. Um, then when they got off the boat, he's standing in line, praying, 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 and one of the guys walked up behind him and said, I really believe I have to pay your entry tax for you and your family. Uh, here's the money. There's like three people before him and the, the end, right, of getting through there. Think of that testimony. Think of that encouragement of what it was like where they were relying on God for their very meal, that they were relying on God for everything to get them across and to get in there, and God provided. Think of how that must bolster their faith and encourage them. I really have to question today if we as a, a modern church have lost that ability to trust in God. When we look at our own finances, what happens when we need something? What do we do? We go to our line of credit. We go to our credit card. We go to the bank. Just think of what we're missing out on. When now we rely on the bank to foster our needs instead of relying on God. What are we losing? What are we missing out on? Well, I want to tell you that there are some benefits to being a generous person. 
not only does the Bible tell us this, but modern science has confirmed it as well. And, and let's just get into some really fun science at this time. There's a little image uh, to put up on your brain. How many of you have a brain? Yeah. Put up your hand. I hope you do. I hope you have a brain. There's a song about that, If I Only Had a Brain. But they've done some studies on what it means to be a generous person and how it affects us. You have the amygdala, amygdala, that's a fun word to say, which is this little body of nerves in there. And the more excited it does, the, the amygdala controls the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is like your control center of your brain. It's, it's kind of like the conductor. It says, okay, do this, do this, do this. So when the amygdala uh, is in a state of heightened pressure, of, and it can be caused by a lot of things, stress, um, they, they find people who, who are depressed, uh, who have post-traumatic stress syndrome, um, who have these high, they have, their amygdala is just firing all the time, right? It, it's, a, it's a conscious thing that is always happening. It then controls the hypothalamus. With the hypothalamus is what tells the rest of the body. It's like your, your fight or flight scenario, right? If you're standing there and somebody comes up to you and scares you, how many have ever had that happen? How many like when that happens? How many want that to happen to them right away, right? No. But when you're in this fight or flight and someone scares you, your, your amygdala sends out a message to your hypothalamus. Your hypothalamus says, okay, muscles, blood, all the stuff need to do this now. And it happens Instantly. That's how, how cool the human body is. It's, it's not like, okay, we need to process this form and then this form, and then we have to do this form, and then this happens. No, in the human body, it's like done. And you get this extra energy, you get this extra strength, you're ready to go. And that's the way God promised and God created our body so that we can deal with stressful situations, right? Our body gets to the place where it's ready. Now, the problem with a lot of us in our modern age is we're always in this state, okay? We're always in this heightened state of fight or flight. Um, and, and when you do that, it leads to depression. It leads to a lot of negative things in your body. It's just a bad thing to do because your body should not be in that state all the time. It's like an emergency state that your body should only go to once or twice, okay? If you go into it all the time, it just leads to really bad things because you're, you're basically running your body from... 100% effective to 1,000% effective, okay? When they, they did this study, and they, they took these people, and they made a test for them to be generous, okay? So they, they could do something that would either earn uh, a reward for someone they knew who was in need. It could earn it for some charity, or it could earn it for themselves. The interesting thing was is as they had the person in the MRI and they were showing them faces and images to test to see what they were going through, what they were feeling, they discovered, without a shadow of a doubt, that when people gave towards something that benefited someone they knew, their amygdala calmed down. It started to relax. It stopped sending the messages of, oh, time to do something now. Now, when it was given to people that they didn't know, like a charity that was unknown, it wasn't the same effect. And when it was generous and they got the reward, it still wasn't the same effect. It was only when they gave towards something that they knew, okay? And it had this effect. So you can actually prove scientifically that being generous will make you happier. It's actually a scientific fact. But the Bible's been telling us that for years, the ability to grow in, in dependence upon God and being generous is something that, well, we've been told about for years. First John 3.17 says, but, he who has, but whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? That's a tough statement. Hebrews 13, 16 says, And do not neglect doing good and sharing, for such a sacrifice God is pleased. Acts 20, 35, And everything I show you that by hard work in this manner that you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, and that he himself said it is more blessed to give than receive. Matthew 6, 21, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. 
I could spend a lot of time going through all the sayings that Jesus said about money. And the fact is, to sum it all up, it's really, understand this. Money is a tool for you to use to expand God's kingdom, not something to control you. And a lot of us are controlled by our finances. We make decisions based upon our finances. We make patterns. We do things according to our finances. When in reality, those are the areas that we should be listening to God and saying, God, how do we do this? So let me ask you a simple question. How should you give? Now, I'm not talking about checks or MasterCard or visas or debit or online. You can do all of those things. But Matthew 6, 1 to 4 says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you will have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be honored from men. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that you are giving in secret, and your Father who sees what's done in secret will reward you. Okay? So how do you give? Basically, in secret. Okay? There's no fanfare. There's no things. That's one of the, the greatest things that I really enjoy about modern technology is you have the ability to give to the church where nobody even knows that you've given. Okay? If you pull out your app that we have, or pull out your phone, open up the app, you can give. It goes straight uh, from your bank. It goes into our bank account. It gets registered uh, in our software system that you've given, so you still get your tax receipt. And it means no one even here needs to know until the end of the year we just print this, send out tax receipts, and it's done. Okay? Uh, I love that idea because you can give in secret and nobody needs to know. And uh, just so you guys are aware, as as a pastor right now, I have no clue what people give. I don't. We've had other people who maintain those and, and have that. And it, it, for me, it's been a real source of joy because I don't need to know that. Now, the next question, why do we give? 1 Timothy six seventeen to 19 says, Instruct those who are rich in the present world not to be conceited or fixed their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, and to be generous and ready to share. Storing up for themselves the treasures of a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. So as I already alluded to, why do we give? It's not because the church has a need. Okay? Now, that may sound weird, because most of the time when a preacher stands up and says you need to share, it's because there's a need that needs to be met. Okay? That's not your motivation. It's not to meet a need of the church. Okay? Some of you may have a different opinion on that, but I really believe that God meets the needs of the church through individual instructions. Okay? I believe that when you speak to God and when God speaks to you and tells you what you need to give, if every one of us did that, the church would have absolutely no financial concerns, okay? I believe if we hear from God and we obey God, that every cent comes in. So that brings us to the next question. How much should one give? Well, 2 Corinthians 9, 5-7 says this. So I thought it necessary to urge your brothers that they would go on ahead of you and arrange beforehand your previous promise of a bountiful gift. So then the same would be ready as a bountiful gift and not affected by covetousness. Now I say this. He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do just as he proposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. The real key to this is don't give under compulsion, okay? Now, if I was to stand up before the offering and say, okay, we have this need, you have to do that, would you feel compulsion to give? Yes, you would, probably. So there's a difference. When we, whenever we will talk about money, we will take the offering first, as we've done. And then we will share the need, later on. So you have time to pray about it. You have time to consider it. It's not this forced thing. You know, I, I've been in 
services. There's this one church in Edmonton that uh, I won't give you their name, but one time this the speaker came in and just gave this great, great message, this great, great appeal. And in the offering that we could, he pulled in was $100,000, okay, in one Sunday. What the church noticed was the subsequent weeks were all lacking in about $100,000. So people just gave one time to this guy who took the money and left, uh, and the church was left with the shortfall, okay. For that reason, we've actually written in our constitution that the only one who actually can call for an offering is the pastor or one of the council members. Okay? Somebody can't just come in off the street, a guest speaker, and call for an offering. That can't happen here. We won't allow it. Because I want you guys to give because you've heard from God what you're supposed to give. You've purposed in your heart. You've prayed about it. If you're a family, give as a family. Pray about it with your kids. Okay? What we're supposed to give, when we're supposed to do all this. So the, the first key to this is not under compulsion, okay? I'll say this. If you feel obligated to give, don't. That may sound a little strange coming from a pastor. But if you feel obligated to give, don't. Why? Because you're giving with the wrong motivation. You won't be blessed by that. It won't encourage you. It won't make you feel good. It won't do the, the, the benefits for you. You're just giving out of guilt. And you will probably later feel that, hey, I shouldn't have done that. Instead, prayerfully consider your giving. Now, one of the things that I will not do in this church, and, and I've had many people outside of the church come in and offer the service, but is automated giving, where you could set up a thing in your bank that every month you'd give this amount and it would be directed into our account, and it would be a regular source. And everybody who's involved in financial management in, in, for churches all say, this is a great idea because then you have a steady flow of income always coming in, always coming in. And I'm saying, no, stop. Giving is an act of worship. It's not something that can be automated. Okay? It's not something that you can just hit a button and say, okay, just like I'm paying my cable bill every month automatically, I'm going to pay the church bill automatically every month. It doesn't work that way. It has to be a, a conscious effort every time you give. Whether it's putting it in the plate or doing it through the machine or giving through your app online, it needs to be something that you are prayerfully considering. God, what is it that you want me to give this time? And I know there's a big debate going on right now um, about tithing. Right? I saw this thing on Facebook. is Oh, there's no such thing as tithe in the New Testament, blah, blah, blah. And... and they just go through all these things that half of the stuff doesn't even make sense what they're stating. Um, but my question is simply this. If God took out tithing in the New Testament, don't you think he would have told us? Don't you think he would have told us? If God told us to do something throughout the Old Testament and then brings it to the New Testament, and just because he doesn't reiterate it over and over again... Does that mean it's no longer there? Does that mean it's no longer a function simply because, yeah, this is a New Testament now, and no, we don't. I, I believe that if God ended the principle of tithing, he would have told us. He would have said, guess what, guys? You don't have to tithe anymore. Now you can just give whatever you want. Okay? He would have told us. But this is, again, something you've got to purpose in your heart. You need to pray over this and say, God, is this what you want me to do? I can't stand up here, and ne neither will I ever stand up here and say, you need to give X amount. Because what that does is that now cuts the line of communication between you and God and now becomes me to you. I don't ever want to be in the way of you and God. I never want to do that. But for you, it's a matter of sitting down and saying, okay, God, how much do you want me to give? You know what? Tithing is a great place to start. <laughs> but I don't believe it's a be-all and end-all. I had this desire when I was quite a bit younger. I sat down with Shirley and I said, Shirley, I really feel God wants us to give this amount of money, right? And she kind of looked at me and, and we were on a very set amount of income at that time. Um, and the amount of 
we were giving was quite significant. And she looked at it and she goes, well, can we maybe give it over the next few months? And I'm like, okay, if that's the way, if that makes you feel good about that, yeah, we're, we're giving it over a set amount of months instead of giving it all at once. God then took that amount that in those days seemed so high and so powerful, and then he gave me the ability to pay that every single month, to give that amount far more often, like every month I was doing that. And a lot of that is because I was had my own business and God was allowing me to have substantial income coming from this business so I could give far more than 10%. My prayer to God when I became a full-time pastor here is, God, I said, give me the ability to still give that same amount. Even though I'm making far less than I was, please give me that, same, uh, that ability to give that same amount because that was on my heart to be able to do that. And you know what? For the last five years, God has done that. God's given me the ability to give more because I love to give. You know what? I, I get a joy when I give. Science has proved it, okay? <laughs> you get this satisfaction. You get this joy. And I've experienced that, okay? I, I know what it's like, and so I love to give. Uh, the other thing that uh, I just want to share with you in closing is one of the lessons that God taught me uh, like, I, taught, I was taught giving from a very young age. I remember when my, I, I would get a gift uh, from my grandma every Christmas. And, and back in these days, this was a lot of money. She would give us $100, right? $100 in those days was a lot of money for a little kid. And my parents were always there to remind me, okay, 10% of that belongs to God. So how much is that? I'm like 10 bucks. And now back in those days, uh, we had Barney the Barrel. Have anybody remember Barney the Barrel? No? It was a Mac missions thing. And, and there's Barney, he sat there, and he had these buckets on each hand, and the boys would put theirs in one side, and the girls would sit theirs in the other side. It was just a fun game for the kids, and, and you would put your money in. And I just had this great idea. If I gave $10 in pennies, we'd win. Yeah. And so I did that. I withdrew all $10 in pennies. I put in there, and yeah, we won. The bucket went down. The lady who counts the offering was not impressed. <laughs> she was not happy. Uh, but yeah, we had fun. But God took that, and, and he, he grew it over time. And, and he's showing me time and time again how he, I could never outgive him. Right? Uh, I remember one time. This was back in the days where CRT televisions, remember those big televisions that were really deep? I wanted one, and I wanted a big one. And I saved up my money for an entire year of doing different jobs, doing added things, and I would put it into an account, and it was separate, and Shirley was aware that, hey, we were raising this money for a television. I got to the place where I had enough to buy it, and the TV went on sale. And God spoke to me, and he said, Sean, would you give that to me? And I'm like, God... I really want that TV. I, I think it would be good to have that TV. But he said, would you give it to me? So we talked, Shirley and I talked over, and I said, okay, yeah. Instead of buying this TV, I, we're going to just give that to, to God's work. We're going to give it. And so we did. We gave it away, and I'm like, okay, I'll be happy with my little 23-inch TV. I'll be happy with that. It's good. Don't need to watch TV anyways. Now, this is where something really neat happened. And, I, and I'm not going to say this is, happens for everybody. But this is something where God just wanted to prove to me that he was bigger than me. It was a couple of weeks later where God supplied another source of income where I never even knew this money was coming. It came in, and that TV that I wanted went on sale for like 60% off. And so I got it easily with the money that came in. So not only did God get the work for the kingdom, I still ended up with my TV. And I'm just like, God, that's, that's pretty interesting how you know more than us. That's, that's, that's pretty cool that maybe you actually know better how finances work. And it's lessons like these that have led me throughout my life. Like, I, I can really tell you, 
that God's favor has been upon me financially since the beginning. Never, never having a lot of money, but always having the money needed. Like, I don't know how many of this works for you, but if I need something and I go to the store, I cannot tell you how many times I walk into the store and that item is now on sale on that day. Okay? This, this is a regular occurrence for me. I'll walk in, and, and if it's something from the hardware store, like we, I need something to fix something, I'll walk in, and I, I challenged God on this one time because I had a list of about 10 things that I needed to buy. I'm like, okay, God, let's see what you can do with this. You know, challenging him. It's a fun thing to try. But I walked in. Every single one of those items, and they're spread throughout the store, every single one of them were on sale. So now I do it on a regular basis because I do the grocery shopping in our family. I go out and I'm like, God, this is on the list. Let's see what will be on sale this week. And probably three quarters of the items that are on my list are always on sale that day that I go. They don't advertise it. They don't put it in the flyers. I never look at the flyers. But it's on sale. And, and this is God's favor for us is that he will give us what we need when we are faithful to him. And guess what? He even gives us more than we need. He gives us an abundance in every area. But that abundance doesn't come without first being faithful. You need to be faithful with what he's given you because he wants to give you more. Look at God this way. God is looking at you and he knows that there's a limit. If he gives you too much, you will fall away from him and you will stop trusting him. But if he gives you this much, it will lead you to trust him more. And so God is just waiting there to say, hey, what can I pour out on them? What can I give them? He knows there's a limit because we can't handle more. But he's just sitting there waiting. Oh, yeah, I can give them that. I can give them that. And as soon as we show ourselves to be faithful in the little things, he provides for the bigger things. That deserves an amen. Because God is faithful. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you, God, for what you have in store for us. God, I thank you for your gifts. I thank you for your provision. I thank you for your blessings. And God, I thank you that you are a God who takes care of all of our needs. And God, you supply so much more than what we need.